Jaitma for joining us on the show. Uh, let me begin by asking you, Dr. Jeva, what do you make of the AIB report? Are we any closer to understanding what exactly happened inside the cockpit? Because one pilot asks the other whether he switched off the engine. He replies in the negative. How then was the fuel switched off? Are we able to understand what exactly has transpired and what is your uh, analysis of this particular AIB preliminary report? First of all, is the, our deepest condolences for everybody in this accident. And then we have to know that the investigation is still ongoing and we cannot conclude the probable cause at least for now. But uh, let's take this as an unofficial statement from me. Uh, looking to the situation is really extremely rare for the advanced airplane, the white body like 787 to have dual engine failure in flight after takeoff. And a lot of speculations, the scenarios that people probably lead into the human error, like a pilot problems inside. But based on the preliminary report and then the situation, especially on the voice recorder, we can believe that it's really less likely the human factor will take a part in this situation. But we're looking at the electrical or avionics anomaly triggered for unintended engine shutdown is probably the highest uh, probability that's happened, including the RAD, the ram air turbine also deploy. It's showing that there's a severe problems with the electrical system is at least the dual boat generators got affected in that time. That's why the RAD uh, deployed. And also they found in the racket situation, the cockpit views that the fuels, okay, the fuel switch is on the off position. So I believe we should more concern and focus on how this uh, electrical or avionics normally uh, affect the situations. Right, but uh, uh, Dr. Jardi, let me ask you, is it possible for you know some kind of mechanical failure to turn the switch off? Uh, because there are guardrails is what we are told, and that it is only due to a human intervention that the switch's position can be changed. At the same time, you know, if you look at page six of the report, they have said that there was an advisory in 2018 regarding the 737 aircraft, and it's a similar or the same switch that is applied in the 787-8 aircraft. Uh, the what do you make of this particular observation that the FAA issued a special airworthiness information bulletin regarding the potential disengagement of the fuel control switch locking feature? And this was based on reports from operators of the 737 airplanes that the fuel control switches were installed with the locking feature disengaged. Is this of much importance to you? Yeah, if you can see that the advisory is not a mandatory um, items that require to publish an AD for the 787. And then on the other hand, the 737, we don't have the FedEx in our airplane. The Airbus 320 got a FedEx, but in this case, the uh, complex architecture of the electronics and avionics probably will lead into the situations that the uh, fuel control switches uh, send the wrong signals to the FedEx. And then by that situation, the fuel switch will automatically uh, cut off by itself because we also have the uh, the interval. So it's not like two hands manually put the fuel switch and put it down at the same time because there's some delay from the one engine to the other engine. So it's most likely not a human intervene on this situation. It's most likely based on the glitch on the electrical or avionics. That's from what I learned. So uh, regarding whether the maintenance, the Air India did a mechanic uh, maintenance properly or not, it's out of the questions. We still need to do more investi investigation on that, but we can learn that whatever the advisory from the FAA is not a mandatory that require an AD issuance. Dr. Jardi, let me ask you, you're saying that there was possibly a, some kind of a glitch, a me mechanical or an electrical glitch, which led to the uh, you know problem as far as the engine is concerned. And then it was switched on and switched off by the pilots as a measure to ensure that, uh, and this is pretty much part of their training, that if there is a glitch, the best thing to do is to switch off and switch on the engine. Is that what you're saying, sir? No, here's the deal. I don't think they have much time to even touch the fuel cutoff switch. Okay, that's number one. And we need to explore what's the QRH state about if you got a dual boat engine failure on the fuel switch, especially after takeoff, the workload is so high. If we talk about the potential, the pilot touch the fuel cutoff switch, that's changed the whole game. This could lead into the human factors and then they will uh, put aside about the possibility of anomaly of the systems. That's why I'm talking about the possibility the problems with the electrical system and the avionics glitch will lead into this because they send the wrong information to the FedEx 
from which that the, the fuel switch will automatically uh, cut off in that situation based on whatever the, the delay from first switch to the other switch. It's, it looks like it's not a human base in that situation. All right. Uh, you know, some of the theories that many were talking about have now been completely ruled out. The theory of the bird hit, the theory of the aircraft being overweight, the theory of uh, fuel contamination, the theory of the flaps being at the wrong angle. Do you think that this report has conclusively ruled out all those theories? We know one fact that the engine is gone. So there's nothing to do with the weight. There's nothing to do with the flaps. Even if the flaps at the wrong position, if the engine is still on, they can still fly. The problem now is dual boat engine fail. It could be a bird strike if they found something in the bird, or it could be a contamination of the fuel. But if that happened, there will be another airplane logically got the same problems because the, that airport also reveals some other airplane. It's not just this 787, right? Mm. But maybe if you got um, some problems with some foreign object, debris, or anything inside the engine that could also lead to the problems that we have now. For me, my personal opinion is more likely a glitch in the um, avionics or electrical system. And I believe the 787 will automatically transmit the engine real-time data to the GE. And I hope the GE will gather more information in this, and then they probably already know what happened. So it's really complex situation. Like I said, I normally make some videos like early analysis, but this time I, I keep quiet and waiting because I have no idea what happened, why this kind of G big engine, the 787, the Dreamliner got a problem with the uh, dual engine like this. But it, most likely is to the glitch on the avionic or electrical. Right. It's interesting that you're saying that because, you know, no action has been recommended against Boeing as of now. Do you think that this is a fair call or is it too early because this is just a preliminary report and not a final conclusive report? If we talk about some accidents due to a uh, lost control in flight, it's, it's not hard to, to determine what's the probable cost. But in this situation, I believe it's always better to wait the final result because this is very weird situation and it's nobody ever experienced this kind of situation other than uh, maybe like a human pilot error, human factors. But this one, let's assume that the pilots already did their great job. So there, there will be like a big hole to answer what's wrong with the FedEx system, what's wrong, why the, the, the air AT, the RAM air turbine deploy, why the dual boat generator fail, or at least why the system thinks that the, the airplane lost the generators. So we can say, let's focus on what happened with the technical side on the avionics and electrical systems, what happened with the FedEx, how it works, and the complex architectures will, will be the main uh, factors on this situation. And I really hope the investigator will find the best answer on this. Right. Given the fact that AIB has not recorded any major mechanical or maintenance failures, at least in the past, uh, as far as this aircraft is concerned, uh, what's the possibility of an aircraft that has flown for about 12 years without any serious crash history developing such kind of a snag in your view? I flew the 737 that has maybe like 15 years, 20 years uh time, the, the cycle of the airplane, and everything is good. It's not a problem. 20 years is not that old, you know? If you fly the 777, it's even older than 787, and everything is okay. Then when we talk about um, the situation for crash, and people always speculate, oh, that airplane is too old, uh, not doing the proper maintenance, a lot of things happening behind the problem. So that's why we need to wait until uh, the complete report from the investigations committee to, to publish to the public. Right. Also, the fact is that the uh, data that we have as far as a cockpit voice recorder is just one small exchange that has been recorded at the moment. Do you think that we need to analyze this more in detail to look at what exactly has happened, you know, from the moment of takeoff to the moment of crash? Because at the moment, all we have is the interaction saying, did you switch off the engine? And the other person says no. Uh, is that enough really to analyze what's happened in the cockpit in your view? Yeah, you know, we, we have the silent cockpit philosophy. We cannot talk other than the safety related, start from taxi until you're at the cruise level. So in this case, the pilot is definitely confused. Well, what happened with the engine? And then the captain thinks that the first officer shut down the, uh, the engine by put the fuel cutout switch to cutout position, right? That's why he asked, what, what's what happening? Why did you cut off the fuel switch? And the first officer say, I did not. Because it's really, really weird if one of the crew doing this because there's nothing in the procedures or at least if you got an engine failure, let, let's say the fire, engine fire on the takeoff, 
So there, there are memory items that you need to do, including the cut off the uh, fuel switch. You need to put a file switch at a cut off position, but it's based on the confirmation on both pilot. So in this situation with very little time, they only have like maybe one mile from the, the departure until they crash. I don't think more conversation is necessary. And they already made a good decision to talk less and then focus on what happened because we also know about aviate, navigate and communicate. They don't even say any words much to the, um, the controller. They, I think they declare a mayday, but other, they don't have time even to say any other word. Right. Captain Jabba, we are seeing a section of the Western media based on the AIB preliminary report pinning the blame on the pilots. What would you say to them? It's really hard to blame on pilot. Maybe it's the easiest way to blame the pilot because they're no longer there. They're gone, right? But let's be fair in this situation. You don't know what happened. Uh, even the investigators never say anything. So let's not blame the pilot because the pilot's already confused about the situation. And like the Lion Air happened, if you still remember the 737 MAX? Yes. Okay. The, most people blame the pilot until finally they found out the Boeing has a problem with the MCAS. What mm. are you going to say about it? Don't be too fast to judge the pilot because I believe Air India already trained the pilot properly and the, the pilot even showed the confusion in that situation and they don't have more than two minutes. Mm. If you have in that situation, it's, you will know that it's not wise to blame the pilot. This is not about the pilot skill. If you blame the pilot, it means you will say that the pilot sabotaged the airplane because that's the only uh, common sense result. If you blame the pilot, it means one of the pilot will intentionally switch the engine off and they probably commit a suicide on that situation. But that's not the case because the captain asked the co-pilot, what did you do about a fuel cutout switch? And they said, I don't know. So it means something wrong is happening in the airplane. So it's too early for everybody to say, oh, this is a human factor, the pilot mistake. I don't think that's a nice word to, to say. That is very significant. Is it that it's the co-pilot who was flying the aircraft and uh, it was being monitored by the pilot in command? Uh, given the fact that in the CVR, we have this exchange between the pilot saying, did you shut off the engine? And the other person says no. Uh, what are the odds that it is the pilot in command who's actually putting that question across to the co-pilot who's flying the aircraft at that point of time? What is your analysis? Flying the jets, we have the crew resource management, the CRM, which is each individual in the cockpit, its required crew member has a specific job and duties to do their role. Let's say the, the, the first officer flying the airplane or the captain flying the airplane, they will focus to do the, all the SOPs as the pilot flying and the other pilot will act as a pilot monitoring and everybody will do their own specific job. So in this situation, if something happened, if something anomaly happened, there will be a good deal if one of the pilot asks the other pilot, this is a part of the crew resource management, what did you do or what happening? Do you know what's happening now? Something like that. So that's a proper communication that they already make. The captain is not yelling at the first officer. The, the, the captain is not um, doing the allegation for the, the first officer. Instead, he's asking about the fuel cutout switch. And then the first officer answered properly in the short term, I did not do that. So it means both pilot agrees there's something wrong with the airplane. And number two, if there's a previous problem with the mechanical, the ACAS systems will show the problems. But in this case, we need to know from the investigation, is there any malfunction alert or any, in the Airbus, you got an ECAM system show up, in the Boeing, maybe the non shutter lights come out. So that will help the investigation when they find what happened with the uh, annunciator screen or any warning that appears in the cockpit. But in this case, both pilot, I don't think they see anything before because if, if, if they saw any warning dur during the rollout, during the takeoff roll, they will definitely abort the takeoff. In this case, until the V1 and rotate, they didn't see any anomaly, any warning. That's why they decide after the V1 speed, they decide to remove the hand from the throttle and start rotating the airplane. Then the problem happened when they lift off. So it means there's no word, there's no CVR, there's no evidence to say that there's an initial um, warning from the airplane that something happened. So nobody right. knows anything, nobody knows the clue.
Absolutely. And in fact, you know, I'd just like to quote from page 13 of the report. They say that the AFT EAFR, which is, of course, as we know, the uh, electronic uh, flight recorder, enhanced airborne flight recorder, uh, the AFT one was substantially damaged and could not be downloaded through conventional means. The CPM was open to inspect the memory card. The damage was extensive. What's the possibility, uh, Captain Jema, that we could have lost some data? Or do you think that uh, the way that these, uh, you know, recorders, the black boxes, as they are called uh, locally or colloquially, uh, could have you know lost some of the data, or do you think that uh, they are built in a way that they are almost uh, indestructible? I believe they should replicate whatever in the EFR analysis. It's like electrical buses status thing, uh, switch logic signals, and power interruptions, if any, because I believe there's something wrong with the electrical system since the the ram air turbine deploys. So. If the memory cannot be retrieved, so they probably need to do any replication on the AFR analysis and also do the teardowns of the field control switches, the throttle quadrant, uh, do some crew background checks and, and get involved to uh, the Boeing and GE need to get involved in these investigations because they really need to replicate whatever happened on the EFR analysis. All right. Captain Jema, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us your analysis of what has happened. And we're going to come back to you as and when the final report comes as well to get your perspective on what really has taken place. Thank you so much, Dr. Jema, for joining thank us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.